You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community, and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the Writing Community Chat Show.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to this week's Writing Community Chat Show. Hello everybody and welcome to a Wednesday edition of the Writing Community Chat Show. It's a great time to be doing an extra show. Uh, we used to do a show every Wednesday as well as Fridays, but obviously time restrictions caused that uh, become a bit of an issue but we are looking to try and get that back up and running at some point. We'll see how things go. However, you may notice I'm sat on my own today, and that is because Mr. Hooley's unwell. So send him some love on social media. Yeah, he's not feeling very, very well today, and he's already in bed, love him. Um, I'm sure he might even tune in, you never know. Um, so so get well, Mr. Hooley. We look forward to having you back on the show, and hopefully you can make Friday show, because Friday show is the Brooklyn Book Festival. And that's the third year in a row we are doing that with alongside Queer Indie um, for a virtual panel. And we can't wait to do that show because it's it's a lot of fun. It really is. Um, the Brooklyn Book Festival is an incredible, massive festival for books in America. And they do a whole host of uh, virtual panels leading up to that. And in fact, they started on Monday. If you go onto their website, you can see all the virtual panels they're doing, including ours, which is 8 p.m. UK time Friday, 3 p.m. EST. I believe. Um, so go and go and check that out. On Friday, we won't only be doing that show, um, the Brooklyn Book Festival show on eight o'clock at 10 past nine. We will be hosting a live after show as well. If you're a patron of ours, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, but they'll know that they get invited to most after shows. Um, so when we record a show like this, generally on a Friday, we will do a show afterwards where me and Chris uh, deconstruct how the interview went um, and just talk about absolute nonsense. And on Friday at 10 past nine UK time, we will be doing that um, with all of the Queer Indie hosts as well. All of us will be doing a live after show, which you can see live on YouTube and on Twitch, um, which is an unusual thing for you because you don't normally get to see that. But hopefully what it will do is entice you to want to join our Patreon to support us as we support you guys. And then you can see how um, our after shows are conducted. Hopefully um, not too wild as we will be doing that uh, live. But generally, they're pretty well, um, I, I say they're pretty well in taste. We go a bit um, bit real in the after shows and talk about all kinds of things. So, yeah, join us on Friday for the Brooklyn Book Festival and for the after show as well. The, a little update. I am sat in my brand new Secret Labs uh, gaming chair, which I am so excited to be sat in right now. Uh, I won that off RevComp, so thank you to you guys for sorting that out. Um, and it's now a great addition to my really rubbish studio but what i want to know from you guys is what little thing whether it's for writing podcasting streaming whatever that might be have you picked up lately that really you kind of chef to have but it's also something that helps you with your process so if you're a if you're an avid writer is it a new keyboard have you got something very cool um that maybe some of us don't really know about something quite niche in that category um let us know uh i'd love to know what you've you've picked up that helps your writing um, so <clears throat> we've got a fantastic guest on for tonight as well. Uh, really looking forward to chatting with our guest, uh, Stuart S.D. Robertson, uh, or Robinson, as I was uh, accidentally calling him all over social media, which he was uh, quick to correct me. So I have changed that. So thank you for doing that. Um, otherwise, I would have left it with the wrong name, which I've done plenty of times before. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get this guest on pretty quickly because obviously I'm not chatting with Mr. Hooley. Uh, we you normally get a weather update from Wales, but I'm going to give you another one. So welcome to your weekly weather update. Uh, we've got a third storm in as many weeks out here today. Um, I'm sure nothing on your American audience, uh, the storms you get, but it's blowing outside. The trees are, are dancing in the wind and uh, hopefully the internet connection will stay pretty strong and I'm sure it will. Um, so let me get tonight's guest on. Uh, tonight's guest has taken a remarkable journey uh, from the fast-paced world of journal journalism, much like our guest last week. We seem to have a lot of journalists coming in to the author world. Um, and he's moved on into the captivating realm of storytelling. Stuart spent nearly a decade as a journalist, even rising to the position of local newspaper editor. Uh, 
However, he chose to follow his lifelong dream of becoming a novelist, and his intuition was spot on. Uh, crafting his own tales turned out to be an adventure filled with creativity and passion. An English graduate from the University of Manchester, Stuart's life has become a mosaic of diverse experiences, from being a holiday rep, a door-to-door -door salesman, a train cleaner, and a kitchen porter, and even a mobile phone network engineer. He's worn many hats. Uh, today, he's known for his fantastic novels that transport readers into the intriguing and thought-provoking worlds. With that in mind, we will be discussing his latest novel that you can see up in the top corner if you're watching this, which is called The Playground. It's a five-star read being called a twisty mind-bender that readers simply can't put down. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the fantastic Stuart Robertson. Hello, Stuart. Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining me and welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, absolute pleasure. Uh, I mean, it's great to see people going and finding their feet, talking about all of the um, careers you've had. But before we get into all of that and your backstory, yeah. um, let everybody know where you're coming from in the world right now. I am in Rossendale, just north of Manchester. Uh, Manchester. And, uh, and what is that like in terms of the writing kind of uh, the writing? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, community. Community. Yeah. Is there much of a, a scene in Manchester? Um, I've, I've, I do know a few writers in Manchester um, that I sort of uh, got to know through a Facebook uh, group, actually. It's a sort of a countrywide Facebook group. Um, and um, a few of us just sort of said, you know, is anyone in Manchester want to meet up? And we, we have met up a few times. It kind of suffered a little bit through COVID, but we carried on and we have sort of um, continued meeting up uh, in recent times as well. So that's nice. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, how valuable as an author is that to do? And I mean, is it something you suggest maybe indie authors do look for the local physical communities because obviously we have an online community here in the writing community chat show but is it really important and does it benefit your career to kind of go and meet those people and engage with them in kind of a local community yeah i think i think both um, both kind of uh, communities have, have have a lot of merits you know i mean i think it's good i you know obviously know people that i've only only met online and that i've met online and i've met in person as well and it's all valuable i think but yeah there is something great about just sort of meeting someone seeing them face to face and you know, writing such a um, solitary pursuit a lot of the time, I think it just yeah. really does help to have um, other people who know what it's like. And because you know, your family and friends are great, and they they, they support you and stuff, but they don't really know exactly what it's like to be a writer and uh, the process and all that kind of thing. And having other people to talk it through with is just really nice. It's sort of in terms of unwinding and just kind of not not necessarily talking about the ins and outs of what you're doing at that very moment, although that can happen. But just just sort of having a chat and just finding out what it's like for them and you know it's fun yeah it, it, it is amazing uh, the online community how it works and there's a lot of people that follow the show and, and on social media and, and we we communicate with them quite often and when I went to Harrogate this year and I recorded for Pam McMillan it was really interesting to see people like uh, Tina Baker for example she's been on the show we've, we've kept in touch and when she saw me in person she it was it was kind of like we knew each other but at the same time it was just like a really weird, weird experience, yeah. but in a great way. And it is one of those things that whether you're you're meeting people in person or, or virtually and then finally get to meet each other, it still yeah. seems to bring that kind of friendship and community together. It's not a kind of a weird thing. So I think there's a lot of people who, thankfully to social media, can connect around the world, but really get a real connection and share their writing experiences, for example. Um, and I think that's a really valuable thing for us. And um, yeah, I think definitely... I think that's great advice for people to go and look locally as well. I think, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, back in the day, there wasn't the, the online community. And I think that the fact that that's there does open so many doors in terms of possibilities and people you might never have met. I mean, there's an author I can think of, and he was the first um, author I ever really met who other than myself. And uh, <laughs> we, we spoke online for a long time before we met up in person. And then when we met up in person, as you said, it was a bit strange to start with. He, he talked differently to how I expected because I'd never yeah. actually heard him talk. It had all been text before that. Um, but, you know, we got on great when we actually met up and um, you, you just don't know really when you first have met people online, but it's it's, it's, it's often really nice. Yeah, it is. And, and you're quite right. A solitary kind of role is being an author. So mm -hmm. for people who spend a lot of their time as, as a hermit almost, who don't get to go out and socialize, having something like this where, where people can start chatting in the comments here. It's great to see Halo, Brandon, uh, Elizabeth, hello to you and all these people in the chat who can start talking to each other and that will build yeah. and build and hopefully share experiences and advice and and that's all great um right so i'm going to play the first video which is part one okay. of the show 
the rotor writing, which I think is a very important step for a lot of people. Um, it, it's something that we find out your journey and whoever else has been on the show, their journey into the writing world. And sometimes that can unve unravel uh, and reveal, I can't think the right word, um, <laughs> writing tips and advice people might not have thought of or perhaps help people on that journey. So here's yep. the first video and hopefully we'll get stuck into some information about your, your road to writing. <laughs> I think your showing is muted. Oh, am I back now? Yeah, you're back now. Yeah, you got a little mute symbol next to you. <laughs> yeah, for whatever reason, it could be the weather. That video might not have played Probably or will. might have. I have no idea. Um, I could see so, it. I could see oh, it. So. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stuart, um, can we please have a little information about how you came into the writing world? I know you had a few careers leading up to that, so please speak mm -hmm. about that if you feel like that's kind of what led into the journey as well. And maybe what some of the inspirations for your writing were in the first place, and maybe yeah. there might be people out there who are kind of inspiring you as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds strange, but I kind of always wanted to be a writer. I think a lot of writers say this. It's genuinely true in my case. Even as a sort of kid reading like The Secret Seven or whatever, I always thought I'd really like to be a writer. And then I did my um, school and went off to university and did uh, my English degree, um, which I have to just say a lot of my friends at the time who were doing degrees, I knew a lot of chemists and they always used to laugh at me and say, your degree is going to be totally <laughs> useless. And it turned out that it wasn't totally useless in the end. <laughs> Um, so I like to remind them of that from time to time. But yeah, I got to the end of my degree and um, I kind of didn't feel ready to write, really. I sort of felt I hadn't experienced enough of the world. I was still doing little bits of writing, but my writing was very much sort of, I suppose, student writing. And um, I kind of decided, you know, going and being a journalist is probably a good thing to do um, in that, you know, I'm writing every day. I'm going to meet lots of interesting people, etc. And I did eventually do that having gone on a bit of a diversion in the meantime, doing various other jobs, traveling around quite a lot. So yeah, I did do a lot of different things as you've sort of touched upon. Um, I was a holiday rep. I met my wife when I was a holiday rep um, in the South of France. Um, I was a kitchen porter in Bournemouth for a summer. I, while traveling around Australia, did door-to-door uh, -door sales. Um, I did uh, business to business sales. It was all for telecom kind of stuff. I was a train cleaner there in Sydney for not too long, actually, just for a few weeks. I remember being there as a train cleaner on um, New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve in Sydney, known for its amazing fireworks. Yeah. And there was me playing cards with the, the guys waiting for the train to come in about sort of a mile away from all the fireworks going off in the background. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting one. And... Um, then when I when I came back from traveling, my wife um, my wife's originally from Holland, and um, I lived there for a little while, and um, I, um, I that's when I did the sort of uh, network engineer thing for mm. um, I worked for Nokia there for a little while, um, so like all those things were great really in terms of giving me lots of life experience, lots of interesting characters, lots of different kind of perspectives, and uh, I think that really did help. And I wasn't writing at all really at that point, apart from when I was traveling, I did keep a journal the whole time uh, when I was traveling around Australia and when I was briefly living in Holland. And um, I've actually used bits and pieces of that here and there in my books later on. So I was writing in that regard, but it was just casual. And yeah. um, then I got back and I did actually qualify as a journalist, went back to a university, did a sort of postgrad in newspaper journalism and ended up being a, a local journalist for like um, 10 years. And... Um, yeah, that was obviously a great experience as well in terms of meeting lots of people and, um, yeah, just uh, lots of life experience. He seems to have disappeared. <laughs> oh, you're back. You've got, you've got connection issues. <laughs> This this very rarely happens. Sorry, guys. Um, clearly, there's a lot of wind going on, so I think things might be a bit disruptive. Sorry, Stuart. Carry on, please. Am I best to just carry on if that happens again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, anyway, I did my journalism thing, and um, at the end of that, at the end of those sort of ten years, I left journalism, 
um, they basically closed my office and centralized us. And there was an opportunity to um, take voluntary redundancy, which I did. Managed to convince my wife that I'd be the guy who stayed at home and looked after our daughter for a while while she went back to work. Yeah. And that's when I started writing uh, seriously and um, wrote my first book, which didn't get published. Um, it's still sitting in a drawer somewhere. Um, kind of saw, saw that as my um, learning ground, my training. Um, wrote a second book, which was published as my first book. And um, it obviously all carried on from there. Yeah. It's an impressive journey. Um, first of all, I mean, I think life experience plays a big part into being able to write um, authentic kind of experiences and, and situations. Um, but you mentioned obviously your your, your uh, university time and studying yeah. English. Do you feel like either has a kind of more benefit over the other, kind of your education, kind of academic background or or your life experience? Do you feel one is more powerful in, in your writing? Probably life experience, to be honest. I think life experience is probably, I mean, I, I always say to people, to people always say, do I need to, I want to become an author, do I need to do a course? And some people really, really benefit from doing a creative writing course. Yeah. I, I personally didn't do that. And um, I don't feel that everyone needs to do that. If it's something that someone feels they need to do and will help them, then great, go ahead and do it. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be that way. I think if you can write, you, you may not have had the education for it, whatever. Everyone can write to some degree. And if you can write in a way that people enjoy. I mean, one of the things I learned most, one of the things I learned first in journalism, I remember sort of handing in my first story to my editor, who I'm still good friends with, actually. And um, he just sort of looked at it and said, yeah, our local readers don't want to read stuff like that. Because I was using florid words and all that kind of thing. And it taught me to write simply. Um, and, and and I think I learned to appreciate that even the most complicated stories, the best thing a journalist can do is 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 simplify them and make them accessible to everyone. And I think that more than anything really flowed through into my writing. So I do write in a kind of fairly straightforward way, deliberately, um, because I write I like to write so that anyone can hopefully understand, well can hopefully appreciate it and enjoy it. And the, the the depth for me is in the ideas and the characters and that kind of thing, rather than I'm not a guy who sort of writes heavily descriptive um, pieces, you know, I, I write commercial fiction and I'm aware of that and that's what I want to do. And yeah, um, yeah I, I learn a lot of that from journalism. Definitely. I mean, if someone's in the situation then when, they, if they're writing and they, maybe they've had feedback to say that they're perhaps the way they write is quite complicated or hard to read. Would you have any tips for them to be able to simplify it kind of how you've done? read tabloid newspapers <laughs> i don't know possibly it's it's difficult because i mean you develop a style and and, and you know there there is definitely a market for people who want to write um uh, highly descriptive um you know literary fiction i mean there's a definite market for it um and and if that's your style i suppose you have to be true to your style it just isn't my style yeah but everyone's got their own writing style and you know trying to necessarily change it isn't always a good thing i think um honing it is probably more important so yeah. perhaps toning it down a little bit but i mean one of my tips i give to any potential writers is read a lot i mean yeah. read the sort of books that are doing well and that you like and other people like and and and, and you know learn from how they achieve that yeah, definitely. Uh, you mentioned that your first book that you'd written didn't get published and it sat yeah. on the shelf. Is there a reason why you didn't think you, you to kind of go with that again? Or was it kind of something you felt that has had its time for now? That's on the shelf and I've got a new idea, so I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I think it was. It was quite different to what I ended up writing, really. It was sort of it was kind of a comedy and it was sort of loosely based on my early experiences in a local newspaper office. And, um, I ended up sort of moving quite far away from that. And, um, I'll never say I wouldn't ever revisit it, but it was quite, it was semi autobiographical, <laughs> semi autobiographical, let's say like a lot of early books are. And, um, yeah, yeah I think, I think for, for me, it was maybe just, uh, well, as I say, I've sort of just decided to see it as a learning curve rather than, than anything else. I mean, I sent it out a lot and like so many people, you get all the rejection letters and you get to the point where you do I continue with this or do I just take the hit and start all over again and that's what I did and mm. very luckily it worked on the second go because otherwise I'd have had to do it again I mean there's so many published authors I know who've done sort of six or seven books before they've been published I feel very fortunate that it was only my second one that got published but I mean yeah. looks so important as well it's a case of landing on the right desk and meeting the right agent or whatever you know and um 
looks so important. The, the important thing is tenacity, I think. If you really want to be a published author, just don't take no for an answer. Yeah, I've heard that a few times. I think he, not losing faith in in a project or, or a bunch of projects, as you mentioned, possibly yeah. six books later. I mean, timing, as you mentioned, has everything as well. So it doesn't mean to say that that first book might not work well on someone else's desk at another time. Um, so certainly for some people worth keeping exactly. all the things and keeping hope. Um, you mentioned that you that first book was almost kind of in the comical kind of realms. Yeah. Why did you then feel the urge to go down the psychological thriller route? Well, it's interesting because this book now is actually my first psychological thriller. So the books before that, were, were I would describe them more as family dramas. Mm. So my, my prior six books, are, uh, they, they definitely have sort of elements of a psychological thriller. And I tend to try and write with sort of page turning sort of effects and sort of like cliffhangers and that kind of thing. But there wasn't really much crime as such. Um, and so... I suppose with this this one, um, I, I decided to sort of go a bit darker. There was always dark elements to my, my books. I mean, my first book had a sort of a, um, a, a very sort of spiritual ghosty element in that the main character dies on the first page. Uh, <laughs> and basically sort of the rest of the book, he's a, he's a spirit ghost, whatever you want to call it. And um, but there's some very dark moments in that book. There's there's a, some, a very nasty suicide Um there's, there's various things. And, you know, my books have had darkness, but I suppose this one I've just decided to go a bit darker. I mean, interestingly, my editor this time is actually the very first editor I had with my debut novel. And um, I've moved to Booktour now, having previously been with um, Avon at HarperCollins. And she was originally my editor there, and she's been at Booktour for a while, and we sort of got back in contact. And that's how I ended up um, moving to Booktour. And um, it's really nice to be with the same editor again, actually, after after so long. Yeah, she left after my first book, and um, I had various other editors along the way. But yeah, how do you feel changing editors is? Is it kind of helpful to you? You know, with various editors, do they all give some sort of tips that you pick up as an author and continue that that craft? They do. I, I found it difficult in the beginning because in my first three books, I probably had about seven editors, and um, some people experienced this, and it was just a bad timing, a lot of people coming and going. Mm. The, the, the publishing industry has quite high turnover. Um, it slowed a bit over the pandemic period, significantly actually. But prior to that, you know, people would often stay in one place for only a couple of years and then they'd move along. And if you timed it wrong, you'd get one person, then you get moved to another person and then they'd leave. And you, you, that, that's quite disconcerting. But, you know, different editors bring massively different things to a book. So like, um, the first book that I mentioned, I had a, a second editor who came in and sort of re-edited it, and she introduced some interesting other elements that I hadn't even thought about. And so, I mean, you just got to work with it. And um, some editors you'll get on really well with, some editors you will find are not quite as on the same page as you are. But you know, they've all got a totally different perspectives, and um, you just got to roll with it. Really, that's the industry. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to you know thinking about having multiple editors on one book because, mm. as you mentioned, they've all got their own perspectives and kind of take on the story. Have you got to a point at any stage where someone's suggesting a change in the story that you kind of really don't feel is the right kind of change? Well, I mean, I think every every published author would say that the first time they get a structural edit, um, they hate it. Uh, so there's this general rule among most authors I know, don't reply to a structural edit email for at least a day. <laughs> yeah. Usually the knee-jerk reaction is, why do you want to change that? What's wrong with that? Um, but then... Usually with a little bit of time settling down, you sort of say, well, actually, yeah, maybe they're right about that. And sometimes there'll be a negotiation. So you'll say, well, I see what you mean, but I don't want to quite change it that way. And, you know, good editors will listen to you as well. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, no one really likes their work being torn apart. And the structural edit, which is the sort of the big edit you always get, um, before you, you tend to have sort of three sets of edits, but the structural edit is, is sort of pulling things really to pieces, really. And it can mm. be like this whole section needs removing, this character isn't working, maybe get rid of them. Um, it can be sort of move all the chapters around. So everyone dreads their structural edits coming mm -hmm. through because you just don't know what it's going to be like. But um, usually I, I editors know what they're talking about. Yeah, I couldn't imagine having written a story and spending all that time with someone to say to, to remove a character because that must take an eternity to make sure you've got all the aspects at, uh, right and taking the right conversations out and all of that sort of stuff so it yeah. must be a really terrifying moment 
Oh, it is because I mean it, it's just cumulative as well. Everything you change, it's like it's a butterfly effect almost on yeah. the book. Every little thing you change, you have to sort of think of all the consequences. So yeah, I mean, I've had a couple of really hard work um, structural edits over the years, but um, as I say, it's part of it. I mean, an editor's there to be an editor, and um, you know, I think you do have to accept at some point that they they're doing their job and you're doing your job. So. Yeah. Someone's just said structure that's awful. That's a, yeah. Elizabeth Carpenter. Definitely. She's, she's also with Booker. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, what one tip then have you got from all the editors you've worked with that could really help someone who maybe hasn't got an editor, for example, uh, and are trying to do things kind of maybe by themselves or on the early stages that they can apply to their work? I suppose, I mean, like if you've just finished something and you're going to try and edit it yourself, because I mean, most authors do to do it to a degree edit themselves depending on what sort of time scale we're working on leave it for a bit leave it for if you can a month and then come back to it with fresh eyes and you will see things that you didn't see then and try and pretend it's not your work really i suppose yeah because i, mean, I used to be a newspaper editor so i i, I do have an editing hat that i try mm. to wear with myself when i'm when i'm doing things and i can be a bit ruthless with myself at early stages and change things but um the difference between journalism and and publishing is that as a journalist, if a, if a sort of reporter sends an editor a, a piece of work, the, the editor changes it. And I kind of expected that a little bit when I went to publishing. And then it's actually, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> so like, they suggest the changes, but you know, it's your book, you have to make the changes, so yeah. Yeah, oh, that's incredible. Uh, did you find a big transition between writing for newspaper or journalism in, and then writing for story? Was there a big change for you there? Did you have to change much in that yeah, style? Yeah, it was, it was different, uh, I mean, uh, Obviously, you're making it all up rather than <laughs> with, with, with yeah. newspapers. You're sort of sticking to the facts, so that's quite liberating after after sort of um, a long time of doing that. But I mean, I, as I say, I mean uh, th that first book that didn't get published, uh, I learnt so much by writing that. I mean, it wasn't even actually the first attempt. I started a couple of others and did a few chapters and realised that wasn't my thing. And sort of it's about finding your voice and finding out what you're interested in. You don't always write what you like to read. <laughs> I've discovered yeah. you write what comes out really and I don't think you necessarily I mean I, I know an author who who, who who thought she wrote crime but turned out she wrote comedy and um she didn't realize until she went to a publisher <laughs> but like uh, sometimes you don't I mean that's an extreme example but sometimes mm. you don't know exactly what your genre is etc and you just need to let it come out and you write yeah. what you you write what you write so from having dabbled in comedy and mm. family dramas and now uh, psychological thrillers do you feel yeah. like you're still finding your sort of genre yeah I think so I mean it's nice to be able to to sort of adapt a little bit as well I mean what I've tried to do with this particular book is kind of um, hopefully take my existing readers with me um, to a slightly different place so like I've, mm. I've, I've always written quite domestic set um, family themed books and, and the playground is very much along those lines um, it just happens to have some darker, more crimey elements in it yeah. as well, really. So I'm trying to sort of bring bring both things together. It's something we touched on the show before, where, where people decide to write in a different genre. And it's often the case that people will pick up a pen name and try and, and use that because yeah. obviously that transition for the reader. Um, but do you feel like if you, as you mentioned, trying to keep it along the same lines, that's often eases the transition for that reader? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the pen name thing is a tricky one because, I mean, I think a lot of publishers want people to to change to a different pen name for marketing reasons, actually. A lot of it's about getting in the bookshop, in the bookshops. And um, the more digital-based publishers like Bookature are not quite as bothered about that. So they're, they're quite happy to sort of work on a brand, whereas it's not uncommon for authors to sort of be fairly successful with the first book and then to be it to be suggested that they rebrand as a new author. Yeah. Um, because there's always been this big obsession, particularly with supermarkets, which a lot of paperbacks are sold in with the new thing, you know, the new, the new, the new kid on the block. And, um, you know, it's, it's a strange element of the industry, <laughs> but so far I've managed to resist changing my name. I have to say, um, <laughs> quite lucky in that regard. Yeah, definitely. It's it, it. the other thing with that as well is that you might, you know, all that author brand author platform you've built up, could you could lose all of that and have to start Absolutely. again with that um so i guess it's it's working backwards to work forwards potentially in that situation that was always my concern with it really i, I think it's sort of 
it arguably benefits the publisher more than it benefits the author because it's yeah. sort of a, it's a, it's like a quick fix almost like you, you'll get the new sales as a new author and then you're back to sort of being the, the, the not brand new thing again and uh, i mean some authors very successfully rebrand again and again and again and if they can manage to do that and they can juggle all the social media of all the different people then hats off to them i think it would be really hard work i mean a lot of people do it in terms of the i think it works well when you're continuing two different brands do you know what i mean so like you're writing let's say you're writing romantic uh, fiction on one hand and then sort of dark thrillers on another hand it wouldn't yeah. really make sense to do that under the same name and um, when there's a good reason for it i think you know of course it's the right thing to do but I think it needs to be something that um, authors want to do rather than um, something that's forced upon them. Yeah, I agree, definitely. OK, I'm going to try and play the second video. Hopefully this okay. works now, um, which is uh, uh, what's the story? And hopefully we're going to get a pitch from you for the playground. And okay. often I know people are already working on newer books, so hopefully you've got this in the bag. Um, so what's the story? Come in right up. That seemed to work. Okay, Stuart, please, if you could let everybody know what the playground is all about. So it's a psychological thriller, as I've said, about a burnt out mom, recently separated from her cheating husband, off work with stress and haunted by a terrible childhood trauma. Um, a new man enters Beth's life, having rescued a child from danger at, right at the beginning of the book, uh, when she can't, and things seem to be looking up. But there's more to Billy, this character that meets the eye, he, the reader quickly learns that he's up to something. And the big question really is, is what he's up to and what mm. this childhood trauma is from, uh, from best past. Yeah. Which obviously does relate to playgrounds. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see that on the cover, which is, which in the top corner, you can see it on your bookshelf there. It stands out really well. And a lot of people say, don't judge a book by, by its cover, but we all do. Um, and that pops yeah. right out. It's very colorful. And you can obviously see that the young girl on the swing, um, where did this story kind of originate from uh, um, and why did you kind of feel that this was the right kind of story to go with? Uh, again, I suppose it was it was sort of something that would move on from my existing books and take my readers with me and, and go go darker, really. And um, I, I began with a chat with my, my editor about sort of moving a, across. To, to, to book a show with a sort of darker book and we we just sort of played with some ideas really together and we, we like the idea of this playground setting and mm. um i sort of went away from that and um and kind of just had, had a lot of thoughts for me personally the, the 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 coming up with the idea at the beginning is the really the hard part uh, yeah. it's not a part i enjoy i have to I have to admit sitting down and writing it once i've got the plot synopsis is 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 much easier because, you know, that beginning bit, I like to not have everything nailed down totally, but I do tend to have a start, beginning and end. And um, I, I leave room as I'm writing to sort of manoeuvre and introduce twists and turns because I think mm. that helps. But um, that difficult part at the beginning is just getting the idea. So, yeah, it was a lot of different things coming together. I was, I, someone once referred to it as a composting sort of process. And I think that's exactly true. You sort of drop bits in and think about them for a while. And it's not something you can do in a week. Um, Sometimes you just have to go away and watch a film or just not think about it. And it's often just like at little moments when you're not thinking about it, you get a great idea and you push that into the compass and um, eventually a plot forms. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's often with characters. So uh, with this one, it was this sort of the idea of a terrible childhood trauma. I won't say what it is because it would ruin in the book, but I, that came up first for me as this sort of the basis of it. And then it was like, how is that impacting on today? And what could happen today that will sort of bring that back to the fore and and make for a dramatic plot, you know? Yeah. Well, you mentioned the twists and the stories that you kind of yeah. weave into them. And at the start, it mentioned, which is from a, a review, a twisty mind bender, um, <laughs> which is it's a great phrase to, to say is, about isn't someone's it? book. Nice, nice phrase. Um, so it's it's a tricky thing for readers to try and accomplish making mm. a story with a good twist. How do you kind of approach that in your writing? And is there any tips you can give people? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, um, I think actually what I just said a minute ago, but the bit about sort of not um, being too rigid in terms of what's going to happen, I think that really helps because if you introduce a twist that you didn't even know about yourself, um, <laughs> yeah. then I think that really helps. 
Uh, I mean, I've certainly done that. I mean, it doesn't always work, obviously, but like if you sort of are writing to that point and you don't know what's going to happen and then you suddenly think, right, well, what if that was the case and you can write it in without ruining everything, then, I, yeah, I think for me that's a really good a good way to introduce a twist. Yeah. Treat yourself almost as an author. I think uh, it's really nice for, for readers of your work to kind of learn how you kind of create the process. And you mentioned that you kind of have almost like a, a loose structure, but then is it kind of like a a pants to kind of start writing for you as well do you kind of merge the two it is a bit of both if someone says are you a pantser or a plotter i, I always say both <laughs> yeah because i mean publishers like you to produce a, a synopsis at the start of a book um and it's a process that most novelists i know hate um because actually sitting down and sort of giving stuff i mean the first time a publisher said to me yeah we want the plot for your it was my second book with them and i said oh i can't give you that because it'll ruin the, it'll ruin the book and they looked at me like I was crazy and they were like, well, <laughs> you know, that's just what you have to do. You have to tell us what the twists and turns are because that one had a big twist to it. And I didn't want to um, to give that away, but you have to. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I always have a synopsis and I do tend to stick to it, but with quite a lot of room for wriggling. I'm probably closer to a plotter, if I'm honest, than a pantser. But like um, there's quite a bit of pantsing going on <laughs> along the way. It's yeah. a weird pantsing. It always sounds strange, but any anyone in the writing business knows exactly what you mean yeah if someone doesn't basically it's the, using creative flow and following the characters to create the story right yeah. um yeah i mean it, it's had great... one of the most famous what's that sorry well, stephen king's one of the most famous uh, he just comes up with a concept and goes from there you know i think that'd be really scary um yeah. i like to know where it's going i think i like to have an idea of the ending and then you know let it wriggle along the way Definitely. Uh, yeah, Stephen King is renowned for that. I'm sure there's a lot of authors, uh, surprisingly, who, who are pantsters, but there's a lot of people who are serial plotters as well. Mm. Um, so again, that's finding your own feet in, in that kind of world. Um, what other feedback have you had from this? And is there any feedback you've had from readers that surprised you? For this particular book or just yeah. generally? Um, it's early days, really. I mean, uh, I, I tend to tend to don't read loads of reviews. I tend to re read them through sort of through my fingertips a little <laughs> bit, um, I, I, particularly at the beginning of the journey. I, I, you know, obviously you're hard into it now, but particularly at the beginning of the journey with my first ever published book, I find it hard if you got like a one star, you know, yeah. like everyone does. And, you know, it ruined my day for, for, for a bit. And obviously you just get used to it. You can't please everyone. And um, some people sort of like, like to read the bad reviews and learn from it. I prefer mm. to just not read them. <laughs> Yeah, if you know, you're always going to get someone who doesn't like your work, and I just think that's fine. If you don't want to like it, no problem. But I don't necessarily need to find out why. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it, in the audience, if you let us know, do you kind of when you're buying a book, do you judge it by the the kind of the synopsis and the cover, or do you judge it by the reviews as well? I'd like to know what your take is on that. Um, yeah, interesting. So now you've written the playground. Mm. And you obviously your genres are kind of merging or changing along the way as well. Yeah. What's what are you working on now, or what's next? Is it a similar kind of vibe, or are you looking at something new? Yeah, no, it's going to be another sort of psychological thriller, really. Um, I'm, I'm I'm at the sort of the stage I don't particularly like at the moment. I'm at the end of the composting <laughs> when I'm I'm looking at it and thinking, is this is this right? And um, just sort of formulating the the synopsis. And um, yeah, it's a, it's it's. It's too early to talk about, really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fine. It's, uh, it's, yeah, as I say, I don't particularly like this part, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the part in about a few weeks when I'm writing it. That's the part yeah. I like. And well, I like the editing of it myself, actually. Structural edits, as I've touched on, don't particularly love. But, like, um, the first edit of your own work is always quite fun, I think, because, um, you know, you can just sort of play with it and no one else is involved. Yeah. Well, if you're anything like me... Oops.
Um, hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> do it. I'm so sorry. It's all right. I cut out there, so I just turned off my camera rather than ranting. <laughs> taking a hold of the show, Stuart. Um, wow. was, you were doing so well, and I was talking to myself. <laughs> everything froze, and I was thinking, if Stuart is sat there on his own, on the show, on his own. I feel so bad for I him. I'm, I'm just so gonna, sorry. I don't know what I'm going to start saying. I think I better oh, just turn the camera on. <laughs> my goodness. I, I can only apologize, guys. It's, no, it's not often we get these stupid storms, but here we go. Um, Alina says, Chris, hello. Uh, it must be Storm Agnes. Yes, it is that stupid yeah. storm. Um, I am back. Please, please. Um, I'm sorry. But thank you, Stuart, for sticking by. Um, yeah, what we're going to do then is we're going to speed things up a little bit because this is the second time I know it's it must be frustrating for you. We're going to skip on to part three of the show a couple of minutes early, uh, which is community questions. So for you guys, this is your chance to ask Stuart some questions. And I'm going to ask him some staple questions from the show as well. Um, so please, I'll play this little trailer and get some questions. Send them in for us right now. That's part two. That's not part three. This is part three. Dear, dear, dear. Anyway, Stuart, <laughs> <laughs> I've gone really red. It's not happened for a while on the show, but I've gone red. Um, Stuart, uh, okay, I sent you some questions earlier on. Little insight yeah. to you guys. Some of them we do send because they're quite tricky. Um, if you could take any character from the world of fr friction, I was going to say that, the world of fiction and put them into your stories or use them as yeah. a character of your own, what fictional character are you going to take on and why? Can I give a couple of answers? To this? Of so my, you can. my sort of silly answer would be Rupert the Bear, because nice. I, I remember when I when I was a young boy reading sort of um, getting into reading, I really used to enjoy Rupert the Bear and his sort of annual um, and all the sort of the mad professors in the strange world. So yeah, um, I'd say him a little bit. But if I'm giving a more serious answer, um, I've recently really enjoyed, like a lot of people, We Begin at the End by uh, Chris Whittaker, who, who I don't know at all. I know a lot of the crime community know each other. I've never met him, I have to say, but it's an amazing book. And the character of Duchess, you're probably going to expect me to say if you've read it, um, is just an amazing character, um, this sort of 13-year-old force of nature. And if I could in incorporate her into one of my books, mm. I think she would be a fantastic character to use. Just a strong, amazing jump out of the page kind of character which don't come along that often and uh, you yeah. know hats off to him he did a great job with that one excellent okay i know you're a lover of tv and film as well so this can expand to that if you could change the ending of anything <laughs> in books tv or film what ending are you going to change away there's only one answer to this question it's got to be lost oh I mean... yes Lost was, it scarred a generation. It scarred mm. my generation. Really, I have a friend now who will not watch a TV show until it's completed and, and he knows it's got a good ending. Um, you know, I mean, Damon Lindenoff, the guy behind it, or one of the main guys behind it, he has redeemed himself, I think, with a couple of other really good shows, The Leftovers and Watchmen. And I think they both ended well. But Lost, I mean... Oh, terrible. No one's going to tell you that one ended well. No. <laughs> I don't know how I, I would end it, but it wouldn't be like that. <laughs> I, I think I've actually got um, like show PTSD from that show because yeah. th there's things like there's From is currently like on. That. Yeah. Have you seen From that's on right now? Yeah. So I've, I've actually just watched the. I watched it like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So I've not finished this, but there's another show with that kind of concept idea of oh, what's going on. And all it's I can think quite of quite scary that it might do a similar thing at the end. That one, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit just, worried about that. Yeah, I'm just praying. I'll please let it finish well. Um, and there's many things like The Walking Dead's been going on for so long, and instead of finishing it, they put new series out. Fine, but I'm like, just the, the end needs to justify the means because otherwise, it feels like a wasted journey for the, view, the viewer and the reader, right? I suppose it's a bit like the plotting pantsing thing again, and Lost was definitely pantsing all the way. <laughs> yes, and, it was. Um, you know, they, they they paid the price really with the, with the way it ended. I mean, yeah, there's just so many people that have just worried about watching long running shows now. As a result, yeah, that's why I think the world very recently as well has kind of gone down the six episode series kind of route. Yeah, because it's a short package story with a good end and it's impactful. And it's gone down really well. 
Well, I mean, I gave the example of the other Damon Lindelof thing, the Watchmen. That was just a mini series. I can't remember if it was six, maybe it was eight or ten episodes. But that yeah. was it. He said, "I'm not making any more. That's it." And uh, good. <laughs> it's yeah. a good length. I mean, you know, if you just kind of make 22 episodes or whatever it was with Lost uh, over sort of however many seasons it is, you know. I mean, British series have always been six episodes, really, and I think some yeah. of the American ones are now going for the shorter thing. And it's, you know, there's there's probably a lot of uh, good reasons. Yeah, Faulty Towers was one of my favourites, and that's very short. Well, they're remaking that now, aren't they? Are they really? They are doing a new series of that, I'm afraid. Wow. <laughs> well, I say, Fred, it could be amazing. It could the, be. The, the I Twin mean, Peaks follow-up years later was amazing, but it doesn't often be amazing when they when they remake it, things. It's not often, and, and I was very fearful recently when Top Gun, the second Top Gun came out and was actually very good. Yeah, um, that was a big surprise, but brilliant. <laughs> just, well, it can happen. It can it happen. It can happen. It usually yeah. doesn't, but it can happen. So let's hope with Faulty Towers it does happen. Yeah. Um, Alina says Breaking Bad was perfect from beginning to end. Um, a little slow for me, to be honest, to start with. Really? But, but it was good. Yeah. Um, okay. This is one of Chris Hooley's favorite questions, but I'll ask it even though he's not here. Um, if you were, obviously this video will stick around for quite a while, presumably longer than we will. Um, <laughs> if, if someone is going to watch this and they're going to take on your body of work and write your characters or write your stories on moving forward, what advice have you got to them? I mean, in terms of writing my own stories, I tend to write sort of self-contained stories. So good luck would probably be the, the, the answer to that. I mean, I've never written a sort of, I've, people do often say like, you know, do you want to, um, are you going to do a sequel to this one? I've had it a few times from me. I never have done yet. So if they wanted to, um, yeah, good luck. I, I haven't really felt in a position to, to continue it. If you're going to try and continue my work as me, then um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, wicked. Um, so, so I did notice in your bio, you're obviously mm. TV fan, film fan, big lover of burgers and pizza. Yeah, yeah, I do like a burger. I mean, um, <laughs> I think at the time I wrote my bio, it was like burgers were on, really having a big sort of, um, yeah. you know, everywhere. Was, there was a burger place on every corner, wasn't there? And I, I remember my daughter at the time, it was a summer holidays, and I said to her, let's just try and find the best burger in Manchester. And we sort of investigated a lot of different places, and wow. there was loads at one point. My favourite place has gone now in Manchester. There's a place called Salita. It used to be really good, and they used to do these cheeseburger spring rolls, which were amazing, but it's closed. Um, oh. So the, the best burger in Manchester needs to have a, a new crown, um, but I don't know where it is yet. But, yeah, I do that enjoy a, a decent burger. <laughs> that's an amazing challenge to go on with your with your daughter. I think that's and, uh, that's something that most people should take on in their lives. It's yeah. Well, you'll be enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Has 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 food, love of food ever brought that into your stories? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you try to describe a meal or something like that, but I suppose you have to be a bit careful, don't you? Because you, <laughs> you don't want to turn into a cookbook. Yeah, so I might describe a nice restaurant meal or something like that, but I've not sort of <laughs> gone into. I once went in how to. I don't know why I threw this into a book and it's on a bit of a tangent this, but I once described how to sort of seal along a bath in one of my books just because it <laughs> fell into the plot. Because I, I, I can seal along a bath quite well somehow. It's a sort of DIY skill I picked up along the way. So I slipped that into my, um, I think it was about my fifth book. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone noticed, but if anyone needs to know how to seal a bath, it's in How to Save a Life. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you could sp you could sprinkle in like DIY tips all the way through your novels now. That's the only one I've done so far, but you know, I might now yeah. I might do that actually. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe how to cook the perfect burger in the next one. Um, yeah, brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, okay, final one from me in in terms of stable questions. If you were again morbid on your deathbed, looking back at your writing career, what would success look like to you? I think success to me would be continue well being able to continue doing what i'm doing really i mean it, it is my dream job and it is a roller coaster from time to time quite often in fact but i wouldn't want to be doing anything else and if i can keep on doing what i'm doing and keep on selling books and writing books then that would be success for me i don't need to be um you know the next stephen king just doing it enough to keep on doing it for me that's success yeah i think that's a very common goal and it's a very it's a it's a realistic goal for most people. I mean, it's it's the craft that you love doing, and sustaining that would be the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Um, is is there is there a target that you kind of made for yourself at all with your writing, or are you just kind of going with the flow at the moment and working on what's the next project? 
Yeah, just just I'm I'm kind of going with the flow really. I mean, as I say, I, I did make a decision to change my um, genre slightly, as we've touched on, um, and I think that was about just sort of trying to expand my audience, I suppose, to some extent, because um, you don't want to get sort of stuck in a corner and that that's what you do kind of thing you know i mean that's how marketing tends to work really in terms of publishing and um when you feel that you're being pigeonholed you tends to make you bristle up a little bit and think right well i'm going to do something different this time i mean <laughs> yeah you need to think about what you're doing differently but like i mean I, with my first book i decided with my second book to write a third of it backwards which it felt like a great idea at the time <laughs> it was me trying to not be pigeonholed i'd watched memento the night before actually yeah before I did the snaps and I thought, right, I'm going to do that third. And I think it worked really well if you read the book all in one go. But if you sort of read it like a lot of people do, just sort of bits and pieces over a long period of time, I think it was a little confusing. So like you, you kind of learn from these things. Yeah, definitely. That that sounds a bit confusing. You mentioned a lot that obviously you wrote your synopsis first and, and that for some people might be a bit unusual mm. and that might be a bit they struggle with. So how do you approach writing your synopsis? And have you got any tips to kind of create one that, is maybe fluid yeah. makes sense actually i mean i was thinking about this the other day because sometimes you think well i'll just go away and do something else but that works to a degree but i think really with the synopsis you just have to sit down in front of the computer and work on it and keep working on it and and polish it and change it and it, you need to actually be there to do it I've, I've noticed that over the last few days it really does help if you sit down and, and work on it because i think you know it's just keying into the the exact ins and outs no one likes doing it, but publishers all want it. Um, so if you're going to submit a book and you're a sort of, um, you've got your book finished, even that's daunting when you've written it already, I think, to, to sort of squash it into a side of A4 or two sides of A4, whatever you're wanting to do, um, because you're, you're giving away all your plots, twists and yeah. turns and, um, you know, you're having to skip bits and you're having to summarize characters but it's what publishers want and it's how they decide um they take those synopsis into sort of meetings and that's how they decide if they're gonna if they're gonna go with the book or not so it's just a necessary evil and you just have to do it <laughs> and no author likes doing it yeah do you ever know that they're doing that with your syn synopsis or is it saying like oh today we're gonna go and discuss that oh yeah, i've, I've heard that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 definitely um because i mean you know you you, you you need an edge in your corner if you want to to sort of go with the book and it, they sort of go in often and sort of present the idea to the to the team and um, ideas can get sort of turned down at that point and that's quite frustrating obviously but like um yeah. usually i think an editor will know what will get past um that meeting or whatever and they'll they'll work with you to get it right and then they'll go in and they'll say they'll they'll, they'll i mean it's probably quite a tough job going in and some i always find it difficult summarizing any book um but you know they they obviously do it and they do it well i guess <laughs> yeah certainly do okay guys um any more questions please send them in we've got one from halo thank you very much uh she says how long do you wait before <laughs> shiny new idea and writing a first draft um I, yeah well it doesn't that necessarily need to be very long i mean it depends on what kind of um if you're just sort of writing for yourself and you're not at the point when you're on deadlines and that kind of thing, then I think there's always a temptation to jump into the shiny new idea. It can be a mistake in terms of, I think, if you're already embroiled in something, it's probably better to stick to that until you get to the end. Because if you keep chopping and changing, you're never going to get a product that you can polish and get to the point where you can submit it. But like, there's always this lure of the new idea. I think it often happens if you are in the middle of something. And um, if you're in a position like where you've got a deadline in sort of, six to 12 months and your ideas there and they you, you're working with it then great go for it straight as soon as you can you'll probably write better as a result because if you're really enthusiastic about an idea then you know you can really get your teeth into it but it doesn't always work like that sometimes you get the new idea but you've got a deadline for another idea and um, by the time you've done that you go off the idea i mean i get all kinds of great ideas that seem great at the time and then the next morning or the next day you're the next week you're like mm, actually not so keen on that anymore it's a bit too much like something else or it's just it felt good at the time or the ins and outs of it are too complicated but i mean keep a notebook any great new shiny ideas write them down definitely write them down and um, you might come back to them one time when you're looking for another idea and think oh yeah that was a good one yeah i, I imagine that. even a long way down the line you could think that idea is better then you know and pick that back up but i, I we've often heard on the show some people have like multiple work in progress at once and that, that kind of blows my mind i can't do it i no. can't I, I, I really struggle with that I, I i like to be right at the end of a period of, of a piece of work like 
finished editing and stuff before I really get into the next. I, I physically find it difficult because I, 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 I suppose when I'm creating a book, it's like a world in my head and I've got those characters. And I, I hats off to the people who do it. And there are people who do it and they'll be writing two things at once. So they'll write maybe even more than that. I just can't do that. I, I, yeah. I need to finish one idea, then start the next. And that can be quite a quick process. I mean, uh, I've been writing a sort of a book a year for, for, for quite a while and um, it can be done. But like, I do like to have my start and finish. And, you know, yeah, I don't know how they do it. No, nope, no idea. Um, thank you for that question. Elena, thank you for yours. What genre do you like to read the most? All sorts, actually. I mean, I, I used to read an awful lot of literary fiction when I was a sort of English graduate and that kind of thing, a lot of classics. Um, in recent times, because I'm writing in psychological thrillers now, I'm, I've read quite a few psychological thrillers. I actually enjoyed, uh, I know you had John Mars on on Friday. I've enjoyed one of his for the first time recently. Um, uh, Keep it in the family. Um, that was really good, um, having not read his before at all. Um, and uh, yeah, there's one by... The, the, the Only One Left by Riley Sager. That's what I'm about to start. That's another sort of psychological thing. It's got a really dramatic picture of a house on a cliff, and I've heard some good things about that. So, um, yeah, I'm reading a lot of that kind of thing at the moment, but I'll read all sorts, anything that uh, appeals. don't read that many comedies, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, don't know why. I like comedy films and stuff, but I don't tend to read many comedies. What, what's your favourite comedy film? Groundhog Day. Oh, nice. Excellent. Okay, uh, yeah, without one more question. Of that. Yeah, one more question from Halo. Thanks for sending these in. What's the toughest part of a book for you to write from be uh, beginning, middle, or end? Middle. Definitely the middle. Because I think at the beginning, you've got what we just said, this sort of exciting excitement of the new idea. By the time you get to the end, you tend to be racing a little bit, I, I find, especially if you know where it's going to end. But the middle, that's yeah. where you get your doubts, and that's where things maybe aren't coming together quite as you hoped they would, and that's where you can lose faith. Um, so definitely the middle is the worst part for me. Do you feel like in the middle part, do you have like a word target to hit or do you ever feel mm. like that's the part where you can expand the book or the middle no, part? No, I, I do really always work it. on a target. That's when I'm when I'm writing, a, I'll work out how long I've got and I'll sort of work out how many words to, per day and I'll really try and stick to that. I think it's you've got to be regimented, I think, if you, or you just, you'll just not get around to it. It's so easy to procrastinate. Yeah, interesting. And Elena sent one more in, so... We'll We'll squeeze it in just before we finish up, as okay. as the weather's holding up. Um, <laughs> do you think about the story you're writing in your ord ordinary life, and does it affect your mood if it's a dark story uh, like the last one? It's a great question. Yeah, it definitely can do. Um, I, I sometimes think that if I'm trying to develop the story still as I'm writing, I like to try not to think about it. But then when it pops into your head, it's often if you, I find the shower a really good place for ideas developing or, or a bath. There's something to do with water. I've read about it. <laughs> don't know what it is. But like, I, I, if I'm not thinking about it and then it pops to my head, that's often a really good way to develop it. And yeah, yeah it can affect my mood. If I've just written a really, I remember having quite a nasty experience recently involving a sort of car accident. And um, I wasn't involved in the car accident, but it sort of happened quite close to me. And the next day, I had to write a really, tough scene in this book and the mood from this and that together just made me really not in a happy place for those those times together but yeah so it's i think can, if you're not yeah. feeling the mood of it then you're not probably writing it right yeah i mean plenty of people have mentioned how they've they've become emotional whilst they're right creating their work you know so yeah. i'm guessing if you get into that stage you really are getting the right feels in that story and that's gonna relay hopefully to your readers as well i think so i was think if I'm if I finish a book I like to get I mean obviously you chuffed that you finished it <laughs> and you've written the end although that never appears in a book but all writers write the end at the end even though it's not needed um but like it's a sort of process but then uh, if you get to the end I always really like to get the sort of I like to have an ending that that resonates or whatever and if I get to the end and I feel the sort of tingly feeling then I'm like yeah you've nailed the ending otherwise it's like no you need to come back and redo that brilliant Okay, guys, we have hit the hour. We survived that long. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you, all of you, so much for tuning in live. It really means a lot to us. But before we wrap this up, Stuart, where can people find your brand new book and more about you? So the best place, uh, you, you can go to my website, sdrobertsonauthor.com, or my book's available from Amazon, uh, ebook, audiobook, paperback. Um, it's called The Playground, as you can see. Just uh, look it up, and you should be able to find it. So and can and when we tweet and x when we whatever um post this on socials we'll put the links to those as well and the description of the uh, the website and the podcast you can find those links um yeah 
well, just before we go, favorite uh, read, uh, ebook, paperback. What's your favorite? Uh, I like uh, ebooks best. Ooh. I know that's controversial. That. It's Most mainly because are... I go to bed yeah. and my wife likes to not be bothered by light. So if I'm reading in bed, you, you've got the backlight and all that, and it kind of, um, yeah, it's easier. I don't get Brilliant. into trouble. Okie dokie. Right, we're going to wrap this up because I'm pressing things not happening. Okay, thank you so much again. <laughs> Please tune in for Friday, the Brooklyn Book Festival. We will be on that, uh, the virtual panel with Queer Indie. So please tune in Friday and you can get to see our live after show straight after that as well. Uh, again, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. No, Thanks it's Wednesday. Me. Have a great week. We'll see you on Friday. Please be safe and look after yourself. So we'll see you all very soon. Bye -bye. Play the video. <laughs> It's not weird. <laughs> oh. That was fun. <laughs> I think I think we're still live. I, I don't know what's going on here. Okay. Uh, yeah, if we're still live, hello. I'm trying to end Hi. the show and it's not happening. <laughs> uh, Stuart, just just close it down um, and I'll try and back no, up. Oh, hang on a minute.